Thank you for letting me join you here for the day. Uh, last thing between you and lunch. So we have about 45 minutes uh, or so to run through 15 years of special operations history, how these ideas are impacting industry, and hopefully leave some time at the end for questions. So my goal here today is to talk a little bit about my experiences in the special operations community, but we're not going to spend the next 40 minutes or so just telling war stories. Because that's not really the most impactful part of what I experienced, and for me, not, not the most important takeaway from these many years of combat that our, that our country has been, been facing. I hope to antagonize uh, your, your, your thinking a little bit, because what we learned was we had a great organization with great people, extremely competent small teams, SEAL platoons, Ranger elements, etc. familiar to many of the veterans in the room, but left to their parts, that was an insufficient solution for the complexity we faced on the battlefield. And today's fight isn't more complex because Al-Qaeda and ISIS and these groups are smarter than terrorists of days gone by. In many ways, they're, they're, they're much worse as insurgents. But they have advantages that previous groups didn't have. We all live in the information age, so they can do things easier, faster, in a more di distributed fashion than anyone previously throughout history. And that's not isolated to the battlefield. Right? That's true universally. We just heard it from the last panel. We heard it from our economists this morning. These changes are impacting everyone. That's pretty common in today's discussion. Go back to 2003, 2004, when we were first starting to experience this on the, on the battlefield. This was new thinking. Right? So the, the, the thinking was grounded inside of a pretty simple model that I'll throw up here. The interplay of traditional hierarchies and network systems, right? So your org chart and your network of friends, your network of folks at work, global networks. So think about the interplay of those, those two models. <clears throat> at the core of it, this was the problem we faced. It seems pretty obvious now, but at the time, 2004 in Iraq, when things really started to pick up, no one was talking like this. No one was thinking, well, what if this adversary we're facing is actually a, a 40,000 person leaderless global system of interconnected people? What would that look like? Because the world has never produced that before. Not before this series of conflicts overseas. That's the first place the, the military really saw that type of problem. We fought, we've been fighting insurgencies since there have been nations, right? Going back thousands of years but not a technologically enabled insurgency, coupled with very violent terrorists and extremists. Right? So that, that was a difficult shift for us to get our heads around. So when you think of the system on the left, wh why do we build those? Big traditional org charts, organizational models, etc. We build them because in the industrial age, we found that they were really good at being stable, scalable, they're highly predictable. They're very efficient. They do a lot of very important and good things. If you like sitting in this hotel and knowing that the mirage probably isn't going to collapse on our heads, thank bureaucracy, because there are people in your world that come in here and make sure that it's safe, right? That's not a distributed fly-by-night operation. That is very serious business. But there are limitations to those systems, which we'll talk about. The systems on the right, a network model, what's the reality there? They're unstable, they're less predict predictable, they're limited in how big they can get, limited scale historically. So they've got some disadvantages, right? And this is true in the counterterrorism world because your problems could only get so big. You could have really motivated terrorist groups and they'd bolt together, but they're not going to become a, an army of 40,000. They just didn't have the maturity or structure in place. And so they would have to isolate themselves in time and space. They'd have to do something to draw attention. And then we had much more capable forces that would go out and address that problem. It was locked into a controllable part of the world. Well, suddenly that's changed, right? So that third driver, limited scale of networks, that has changed for all of us almost overnight, right? Who, who here is not within arm's reach of some sort of device 
right now that allows you to connect with as many people in the world that want to listen to you. We all get that intuitively now. But we're still dealing with the impacts of what that change is, change is really going to drive. In the very early stages of the conflict, we realized this is what we're missing. Terrorist groups that are very agile, don't have centralized leadership, don't have big structures, they're no longer constrained by that. If their idea is good enough, and it locks into the hearts and minds of enough people around the world, they can all connect, they can all talk, they can all be part of one system. There are certainly massive differences as you look across these networks, but they move like an army. So that's the challenge we faced. We couldn't just double down on our traditional systems. And inside that traditional system, we had one core advantage that for many years we had taken to be what was going to distinguish us from those threats, right? We had these, high-performing small teams. This is true almost anywhere you look. Any successful industry, if you go far enough down, you all live in this world, this is what you find, right? This is what you invest in. Because you know if there's a hard problem, I want to go to my best team, closest on the ground that can solve that, give them what they need, and they will go execute. That still works really well, right? So let's not underinvest or underestimate how impactful high performance teams are. Because we see the results. Right? When we stepped into this conflict going back over 10 years now, the first thing we did was release these forces. Small units going out on the ground, executing against known threats. And they did that extraordinarily well. Because that's what high performance teams do. This is why we love sports. This is why we love being in small units in the military. This is why we love being in small elements in a, the world that you live in. We want to get out on the job site and execute with people to our left and right that we can trust. Small teams are iconic in the way we think of our country. Right? I don't need to tell this audience how much this means to who we are as a nation. Right? We put these pictures on our wall because this is how we think of ourselves. And it gives us real meaning to be part of a team like that. No one grows up thinking, someday I want to be a mid-level bureaucrat. Right? That's no one's dream as a small, small child. But it's still a critical part of what enables groups like this to execute effectively. Now there are new threats that are capable of intervening into the relationship between small teams and the systems that keep them controlled. But first, let me take you back to my world, and you'll see parallels to the world that you came up in. Because it's important to remember how invested we are emotionally and intellectually in these small teams. So the SEAL teams, I mean, it's in our name, team, is hyper-oriented on finding the right human capital and putting it together in the right small team to go do missions, right? We've lived in that for 40 or 50 years, that cycle. That was the mentality that I stepped into in the late 90s when I joined this organization. And the SEAL teams have refined that initial selection down to a bit of a science. It's a rough science, but it works quite well. Take a bunch of motivated folks, put them through cold water, physical abuse might make it sound a bit hard, bolt them together into teams, get them sleep deprived, get them hungry, and you start to weed out people that don't belong in a space like that. We also teach them how to carry small boats across big boulders. You want to know why? Because it sucks. There's no reason. And people that are smart enough to figure that out, they quit, right? But it works quite well. Look at this, for example. You have six potential operators, might not know each other, and in what feels like maybe a life or death situation. People that aren't comfortable forming team-based relationships they will move out of that system quite quickly. And I'm sure everyone here has felt that as you've come up through competitive space, right? That's not an uncommon feeling. So once you get through a selection phase, then things get a little more interesting. You can start to trust them with better equipment. You can start to trust them by moving around the world. You can start to trust them with missions that actually matter. Right? So the bonds inside those teams 
get incredibly tight. All of you have felt that. At some point in your career, everyone in this room has, I'm sure, been part of a small team, especially in your world, that you knew you could trust the person to your left and right with your life. And that ingrains in us a very deep sense of what we want to be part of. But then we scale these things up, right? And we put them into organizations, which is what you have to do if you want to create something big, right? It's easy to create a startup of eight people. It's hard to create a stable company of 8,000 that retains that mentality of adaptation and aggressive approach to the market. So most high performance organizations tend to look something like this. It's a combination of these two models. At the top, you'll often find a networked executive team. You've come up together, you know each other well. At the bottom, you find your high performance teams. And in the middle, you find the rigid structure that we all like to complain about, but that allows us to do our work with some knowledge of the direction we're heading. This is where all the stuff that we don't like to think about, but that is absolutely critical, takes place every day. Some of you may be in that world right now in your career. Some of you just coming out of it. Some of you will be there soon. It's a necessary component. Historically, everyone played the game this way. The history of industry inside the United States, post-industrial revolution, everyone scaled up into something that looked sort of like this if you were going to succeed. A lot of the work that we've done post-military looks at this through a very specific lens through looking at the networks that actually make organizations function. And if you test that down to the individual level, what you see here is a scatter plot. Every dot is an individual saying, here's who I go to to get things done. So when you ask an organization, how does it actually function? It doesn't come out looking like an org chart. What you see is very commonly this starfish pattern. You see a centralized node of leaders in the middle they cluster together because everyone recognizes them as the critical decision makers. And then you see these peninsulas. And those go all the way out to your high performance teams on the edge. Right? The problems aren't occurring in the middle. The problems are occurring in the market out there on the, on the extremes. Right? And again, that's an okay pattern as long as everyone else is playing it the same way. If you're playing against another big system, they probably look somewhat like this. And so you optimize for efficiency, for human capital, for cost, all the things that we, we know. But now there are new problems that don't have to play like this. They find the gaps between those small teams on the ground. And that's where they're comfortable. That's where they win. They don't win through scale. They don't win because they're better. They were beating us because they found the gaps in our system. Not because they stood back and analyzed it, they just realized that's where they survive. If they played our game, they were gone very quickly. And so the smart ones found out where we weren't. And they could sit there very comfortably and outmaneuver us. And that pattern is playing out across industry right now, across politics, across healthcare, across any big system. There are now these interconnected problems that realize big traditional systems are very strong top to bottom and bottom up. They're like a building, they're designed to scale up. And that bottom rung can support a lot of weight as you grow. But they're weak left and right. They are not designed to take wins from the side. Because historically no one could be, get big enough and create side wins. As you got big you had to play the same game so it was okay to have that gray space. That gray space is killing us now. Quite literally, in our world, that was the threat. So when we let the service, we step back and say, what, how did we get so hooked on this idea of just creating big traditional structure? Some of you may be familiar with Frederick Winslow Taylor, considered the, the father of the efficiency movement inside the Industrial Revolution, and really was the first person to, to, to go to industry and say, look, as we move from an artisan model where people like to have all their own supplies, create their own product and sell it into the market into the industrial age where we can harness power, we can put a lot of people in the same room and produce things. There's a lot of habit we have to break. So let's come up with a game plan on how we're going to run the factory floor. Taylor was very assembly line focused in the work he was doing, but his impact extends well beyond 
those origins. The Industrial Revolution and the might that was produced there is directly correlated to the work that Taylor was doing. But it's also directly correlated to this. Org charts weren't invented in the Industrial Revolution, but Taylor had a very specific argument that he was making, saying this is a management tool. You want to separate people because if they interact without you knowing about it at a leadership level, they will undermine some piece of efficiency. They will undermine the product. They will undermine your ability to predict the output of this assembly line model. So it's better to assume risk in the execution of building whatever widget you're creating and let the market tell you what the problem is and then you readjust up top than it is to have people down on that factory floor interacting and solving problems in real time. And they're artisans, that's where they come, they want to do that. So let's separate them physically and let's separate them in how we manage them. And it worked extraordinarily well. Of course there was cost to that on the human side, right? When everyone was playing the game that way, you could scale and win. But now that has shifted, right? So a purely Taylorist model won't get you where you need to be. And we learned that the hard way. We tried to approach the initial fight with Al Qaeda through that lens. And what we found was we cannot possibly keep up with this threat. We win every single time we go out into this environment. Every time we find a problem, we can deal with it. There is not a threat in those systems that can face the might of the US military head on. However, we're not winning enough. We win in one spot and 10 other bad things are happening at the same time. So despite everyone here having a really good batting average, we're watching this nation around us that we're supposed to be securing quite literally fall apart. That was a wake up call that said, we have to reconsider how we're doing business. So we took our thinking all the way back down to what we knew was our core strength, small teams. So back to that initial point, when you think about a small team, what makes it great? What words come to mind? Just take a second and think about that. Some of what you're thinking right now is exactly what we realized. Small teams trust each other. You have a clear sense of mission. You know why you are there in that environment. The more dangerous, the clearer that is because the junior person will make sure they understand exactly what the intent is before they step off a helicopter into a high threat environment. Those teams have a sense of shared consciousness. They all have access to the right information in the moment. This is true on the battlefield and this is why you can watch an NBA game and see a blind pass. That player moves down the court, they all read the same defense and I just know where my teammate is going to be because we, we have a shared understanding of what is in front of us. When you have those three working together, then you can truly drive empowerment down into the teams. A lot of people like to talk about empowerment today. It's easy to empower in the information age because you can talk to whomever you want, whenever you want. You can put your entire company, your entire association on one CC line and say, go do things. Everybody feels empowered, but there's huge risk in that if not everyone has a common picture of what you're trying to accomplish and what information matters in the moment. So pure empowerment can be far riskier than it's worth. Small teams have this intuitively. You just think like this. You're in the same room all the time. You have coffee together. You work out together. You spend so much time as a natural organic unit that you don't have to really consider, do we trust each other? Of course we trust each other. We're jumping out of helicopters together all the time. We, we trust each other. Scaling those behaviors up into the enterprise was our challenge. We were 25,000 people spread around the globe, every time zone, 30 different countries, all different agencies bolted together, host nation partners, intelligence organizations. So how do you create that small team mentality at scale? That's what we had to solve for. And what we realized was at the ground, it's easy to create this sense of a singular mission focus, right? You get that in the morning when you walk out with your team. You understand each other, you know what you're there to accomplish. In many ways, you share a common narrative. Every small team, and again, you have all been there during your careers, 
if you really think it through, there was some common story. We're all wired to believe in, in, in story and narrative. This is why units in the military come up with their own badges that they like to wear. It's part of their identity. It's part of the story that makes these 12 people the most important 12 people in my universe. We have some common thread. We have inside jokes. We have nicknames. We have a story that no one else is welcome to be part of. And that deepens our trust in one another. That's common across any space that are driven by that small team mentality. But scaling that story up, especially when it's naturally designed to separate and strengthen that individual unit, is incredibly challenging. So we had leaders that stepped in and said, look, we have to change at a, at a global level. We have to change the story we're telling ourselves. Because we grew up in a world where we said, this is what you want to become. You go through all this selection and fight for years to become part of a unit. So you can say, yes, I'm, I'm part of the tribe. I'm, I'm accepted as this operator into this world. We have to change that. Because that's an insufficient solution. We can't lose the skill set. We can't lose the capacity of those small teams. But we can't be solely dependent on this anymore. We have to change into a globally interconnected organization that trusts each other, has a sense of common mission, has a common story to the same depth that those units on the ground have. And that's incredibly hard, especially when you think about the legacy of these units, right? Who here has an uncle or a brother or a cousin or a grandfather was in the same industry? Right? Probably 85% of this room. Same is true of these units. So you layer in that and you have one more level that you have to compete with as leaders to try to change the thinking. My grandfather was on a glider in the first days of World War II, landed in Normandy. My father was a Green Beret in the Vietnam years. That's John Wayne if you're old enough. Not my dad, but it's a cool picture. My uncle was in the SEAL teams in Vietnam. My brother, cousin, myself, served in the SEAL teams, cousin in the Marine Corps in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I came from a family of, of this legacy, as is almost everyone I served with had a reason, a deep down fire in their gut as to why they were there. And it wasn't just they woke up one morning and said, I want to become this thing. These go back generations, much like in your world. And when you were raised from seven years old, the only thing you want to do is be part of a unit like that. No leader can show up and say, hey, we, we had an offsite and we decided we need to change everything about our culture. It just doesn't work like that. This is far too ingrained in the individual and in the unit. It wasn't until we realized we are losing this conflict because there is a new type of threat that knows how to navigate around our points of strength that we started to listen to that other side of the conversation and open our minds to the reality that the infor information age is undermining our ability to fight effectively. That conversation is different in, in every industry, but the threats are very similar. What we did out of the gates, though, was try to ignore it. And this is a very similar pattern to a lot, a, what a lot of businesses will do as they go down this idea of, well, things are moving fast, so let's flatten ourselves out. Right? Let's just access to information. Anybody can open door policy. We can all CC each other. We tried a similar approach. So we had, okay, we have this task force headquarters. It's in Baghdad. It's wherever it is around the world. We have these great units on the ground, and those units actually look like little networks. They're not super structured. They're high-performance teams. So they can all bolt straight into the headquarters. If you need something, call us. Go out into the field, interact with the threat, let us know where it is, and we'll readjust, right? Because we can communicate very quickly. You're comfortable moving around the battlefield very fast. So let's play it like that. Tell us where the new problems are and we'll readjust. So that's what we did. We'd identify threats, we'd interact with them. We'd call headquarters and say, here's where we think they're going. They'd readjust us. We'd repeat, we'd repeat. It took us about a year to 18 months to realize our approach is not only not working, we're making this network grow faster than it would on its own. Because it's never gonna stay and fight us. When we're catching it, it's a lot of luck. Because we might think we're fast, but to a local insurgent, you look like a big dinosaur. 
So it's always incentivized to get out of the way. When it gets out of the way, it goes to where you're not. And when it's where you're not, it can influence, it can recruit, it can develop and expand its army. So not only were we not getting ahead of the problem, we were forcing it to grow and change, arguably, at a faster rate than it would have on its own. That was the realization for us that said, you know what the problem is? It's right here. It's that we are not interconnected on the ground the same way that this threat is interconnected. When we started to look at it through that lens, everyone took a knee and said, wait a second, I don't, I don't like what that implies. What that implies is my team, which by the way, all of us believe is the best special operations unit in the history of the world, as does every other unit out there. We all now have to see one another as part of a similar tribe. We have to see a bigger story than just our own. We have to connect, share information, trust each other, have a common sense of intent, the same way that we do in our own team room. It's incredibly challenging. You're, you're changing not just a year, but generations of behavior. But it was the realization that if we keep doing business the way we're doing it, everyone here will have a great batting average, great stories to tell their grandkids, and we will lose this conflict. There is no way we stay ahead of this threat, even though it's far less capable, less trained, less funded, if we keep doing business the same way. So that set us on this path to change, right? So I'll walk through the areas we had to focus on. But first, let's consider what had changed. And I hope you'll see familiarity here, right? We stepped back and said, this is really bad. What has morphed from what we expected into what we found? The speed with which these networks can grow, we found ourselves in a, in a situation of resource constraint that we'd never imagined was possible. How can this less capable threat be stretching our resources, the United States military and our coalition partners, to its limits? Well, it's because networks have limitless scale. Of course they're going to constrain our resources. We had an inability to leverage our labor effectively. We'd never been in a world where we were gonna run out of operators because we grew up in an environment where there's one problem, one solution. Now we have one solution and 47 problems. So we have to figure out how we're gonna triage and apply our labor effectively. Our advantage in the technology space was, was diminishing rapidly right before our eyes. Setting up a secure headquarters somewhere in the world used to be a big deal, it's not anymore. I can go into any store around the world, buy a $5 throwaway phone and encrypt it in about two minutes. That does not separate you from the threats. And in many ways, we found our rule book was slowing us down because the competition doesn't have a rule book. They do whatever it takes to succeed in the moment. So our big takeaway is there's been, there's been a market evolution here from traditional system into network models. So we had a long argument. Which one is it? Which one's going to win? Well, the answer is neither wins. I would argue for the next 15 years at least, as technology really tries to sort itself out, what's the future of machine learning and AI and how are we going to communicate once all those become common inside of industry? We have to admit that we're in this transition phase. There are key st strengths and stability that come from a hierarchical model. We do not want to throw that away. But there are threats and there are great advantages to moving in a distributed network model. What we eventually became was a hybrid between the two. We have to leave the stability of the bureaucracy in the background because that allows us to do tons of critical things every day around the world, but when necessary, our teams on the ground need to be able to interconnect and move as fast as the networks we're facing. So how do we do that? We addressed two main areas. We didn't really recognize them at the time. What we went through was a five-year iterative design process. What we had was leaders that said, this isn't working. If it doesn't help us, throw it away. If you find something that works, do more of it. And we're gonna break a lot of SOPs and rules along the way. That's okay, because this is the fight of our lives. And we will figure out how to get through it. In that process, we pulled two major levers. Pretty intuitive. We changed the way we communicated. 
how we made decisions, how we decentralized authorities. So we did a lot of process work at a global level. That pushed us towards a faster moving, much more inclusive and transparent system, much like how a network works. That required a different sort of behavior. So the other lever that we were really not aware of at the time was the behavioral shift inside the organization. So I'll talk through both of those and then hopefully we can have time for some discussion. So we'll, we'll look at the interplay between these system, two systems and how we determined to create this interplay between shared consciousness and empowerment. We have a system up here, it has to drive enough shared awareness of what intelligence matters in the moment so that we can empower the teams on the ground to go out and execute with autonomy. But we can't just flip a switch and hope for the best. So we were very structured in how we decentralized authorities down onto the ground. What teams will have what decision-making rights at their level? All of that, though, is bound inside this behavioral aspect. What's the story? What's the narrative of the organization? And how do we have to change as leaders to make all of this mean anything? So we'll look at all those individually. First, the interplay between these two systems. Briefly, when the, when the conflict started, some of you may remember Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. He was Jordanian-born, the first uh, significant leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Zarqawi was charismatic. He was a battlefield leader, front, a front-line fighter. Uh, he was a sociopath. He was, he was barbaric in his violence. Um, and, and he had committed himself. He knew he was going to die on the battlefield. And between when he took the reins and when we eventually uh, removed him from that position, he really drove the process uh, effectively. So our first thought, because we were biased by the traditional org chart we'd all grown up inside of, was, okay, here it is. We've got the leader. He's all over YouTube and makes a big deal about running Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Therefore, he sits on top of some sort of traditional system, right? Because that's what insurgencies historically look like. Go back to any great insurgent throughout history. They build a hierarchy with them and their, their immediate followers at the top. Because that's an easy way to scale something. What we missed was the fact that Zarqawi wasn't brilliant, but he knew, hey, there's something different about today's world. I don't need to follow bin Laden's laws. This is what bin Laden had built. Al-Qaeda was a top-down structure. Al-Qaeda in Iraq morphed. Zarqawi said, I'm just going to become something that looks like this. And I'm going to grow it and motivate it and scale it by telling a different sort of story. I'm going to get the narrative just right so that people from around the world will, will want to be part of this. So he spoke about their element as a movement. Not a thing, not a structure, a movement. If you feel wronged, if you feel like your culture used to be better than it is now, join this movement and we will give you a path to redemption. And the history was abused, but real. And the anger and frustration was deep. And it still is to today, which is why these networks can grow so quickly. So that changed our thinking. Wow, we have a, we have a new type of competitor who's telling a different story that forced us to step back and look at our own narrative. This is sort of the second step that we went through. What's the narrative that keeps them together and growing and keeps us separate? So we looked at these two models. How do they interact? On the left, and all of us are guilty of this, the left system tells a story about control. The right system tells a story about growth and inclusion. Oversimplifying, but that's exactly where we were. Everything we do needs to be done with absolute pre precision and control. It is zero defect mentality because lives are on the line, careers are on the line. Meanwhile, the system on the right, it doesn't care about any of that. It just wants to get as big as possible as fast as they can. And they've got a really good story allowing them to do that. So we looked at those two narratives. And in simple terms, on the left we thought, What's the, what's the core driver? What's the story that gets people out of bed in the morning to be part of the Rangers or the SEAL teams or any special operations element? And it's something like this. I am part of this high-performance team. I have to get up every morning and sprint to be able to keep up with my peers, or they're going to kick me off the back of the herd. It's super motivating, and you get a bunch of really good teams as a result of that. But those teams don't have any motivation to work together, right? 
I'm competitive enough with my own peers inside my little tribe. I don't have time or energy or care about looking across down the street at the next unit. We all live on our own little ecosystem. And when we really started to tease out the writing of Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was the, the most prolific member of Al-Qaeda, a brilliant guy, trained as a physician in Egypt, has been with Al-Qaeda since its found, founding. He was telling the story that Zarqawi was then broadcasting to the world that said, look, there's real deep angst here. And if you want to be part of the change, come join us. With that, our leaders then stepped back and said, okay, we have to change our message internally. Our internal marketing is terrible. What do networks do? They, they build relationships, they share information, they trust one another. We don't have any of that. We have all of that at the small unit level. As an enterprise, we're terrible. So they forced us to think that through. They started to adjust the language and said, look, we're gonna function as a network. We are going to build relationships across these teams up and down throughout the organization. Otherwise, we'll never keep up with this problem. And that was not an easy message to deliver because it undercut some of our core tenets as small units. They eventually boiled this down to a very clear, crisp narrative that was represented to us globally multiple times per week. I'll talk in a moment about how we adjusted our communication cycle. And they boiled it down to this. They said, look, for us to win collectively, we need to be the most credible force on the battlefield because we have to be able to move faster than anyone's ever been comfortable with across borders, across battle space, through agencies' terrain. That's a different sort of behavior. People need to trust us. That will be grounded in the actions of every single operator and team every time we go out the door. And we're gonna look at it through this lens. We, we will be good at what we do and continue to improve. We will have high integrity. When we mis make mistakes, we will share them internally and externally. No one will ever be surprised by our errors and we know we will make them. And most importantly, all of this will be grounded in relationships inside of our units and the outside actors. So if you go out tonight and do three great missions and on your third one, you destroy the relationship with a 23-year-old analyst from State Department that's trying to drive some conversation with a tribal elder in the northern part of Afghanistan, you failed. Don't do another thing until you go fix that relationship because that person on the ground is critical to us, all of us, being seen as a credible force. That was a different lens. So we're not, we're not measuring ourselves through metrics and operations on the ground and traditional approach. This was the first lens we had to consider. Again, that was a hard conversation and our leaders, had they not set that up through the, the window of, we can keep doing it the way we're doing it, we, we will lose. This would have been a much more difficult discussion out of the gates. But that changed the mindset. Not instantly though, they had to remind us on a very regular cadence of what our core tenant, what our North Star was as an organization. So they stepped back and said, okay, now we understand the problem. We understand what we're trying to become and talk about. We're gonna put culture first. We will become the type of organization that's capable of winning in a networked environment. But how do we talk about that? How do we create this balance between empowerment and shared understanding of intelligence? So that started a whole other conversation around the speed of change, which I think is incredibly relevant in any space. Nothing is changing on the monthly, quarterly, and annual basis that we all grew up inside of, that our parents grew up inside of, that our grandparents grew up, grew, grew up inside of. That sequencing hasn't shifted in generations. Now it's radically different. So the mindset that we brought forward into this fight, into this networked age, was very traditional. The military looks at everything in strategic, operational, and tactical lenses. So all of those move forward over time. Those are your different layers of the org chart, right? You have long-term thinking up top, mid-management, resource allocation in, in the middle, and then a very staccato pace on the front lines. Right? All of you have lived some version of that. And when you need to do things, you send intent from the top to the bottom and it moves left to right over time. It's a pretty simple approach. This is exactly where we grew up. You wanna do something on the ground? It comes from the top, it goes through your your boss comes down to you, you execute, you find information, you send it back up the chain, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have the right people and you 
apply real efficiency to that model, it works incredibly well. So that's what we brought forward into the fight. And it took us quite a while to realize also moving forward in time is a different sort of adversary. It's this network threat. And it's in a state of almost constant change. On our best night, we could get from one operation to a follow-on operation being driven by that intelligence in about 48 hours. That's as, as optimized as we could get the system. And it took us about 18 months into this fight to realize this threat down here, it's changing every 24 hours because it is so purely networked. Every morning it wakes up, it gets on the phone, it talks to its neighbor, and it becomes a different army. It has the same core story, the same narrative that motivates it, but there's no central leadership, so it's in a state of constant change. And we're in a state of constant stability. Right? Those two things don't rectify. That means every time we go out on Thursday for a mission, we're actually fighting Tuesday's army at our best. We'll never get ahead of it if we keep that mentality. Right? So we had to shift our thinking and say part of the organization at least has to keep pace with that. So in time, we grew to a very, very aggressive communication model. We adopted that 24-hour cycle, not because we wanted to, because that's what the environment demanded of us. That 24 hours would start with a 90-minute global video teleconference, and we grew to this over several years. But at its zenith, that would be seven to 8,000 people a day for 90 minutes on one common video teleconference. Then you would move into 22 and a half hours of empowerment. You would resynchronize from the bottom up Teams coming out of the field, literally wiping dust off their uniforms, saying, okay, here's what we just did, here's what we learned, here's what we think's happening, here's why we were gonna go this way, but we went that, that way instead. Thousands of other people could digest that. Leadership could react, update their sense of what the problem was, and then everyone was, was comfortable empowering teams on the ground for the next 22 and a half hours to go out and execute with intent. Not with specific direction, go from A to B to C. Go out based on what we just learned and iterate again. So you'd have 22 and a half hours to operate with autonomy and then you resynchronize. We did that for seven days a week, years on end. Super aggressive cadence, obviously. But that's what the situation demanded. Once this system was ingrained, this was the DNA of our enterprise, we felt like a 25,000 person small team. You knew faces, you knew names, you knew, oh, that's the person that knows a lot about X. I've never been in the same room with her, but I know if I need to know about Zarqawi's third cousin, she's the analyst that has all the insights. I know that team, and I think they're wrestling with something that I can help with. All these things started to come together. Right? The transparency of that can be great, but the decentralized nature of it can really add risk, right? So then we realize, okay, we, we have to consider our decision-making authorities. In a traditional system, you can just, two armies can face off against each other. You're trying to take the capital or invade, whatever the case may be. You can get very linear direction. Go from A to B, you can move your army across Europe. It doesn't make it easy, but it can be very structured in how you approach it, right? You can separate forces through time and space. Wars have been fought like this for thousands of years, right? When the threat on the other side changes into a networked model, that approach doesn't work anymore. Because as soon as one team touches it, it changes 14 times before another team can follow up. So our leaders said, okay, we need to give you broad authorities. We can't tell you to go from A to B to C. We need to resynchronize ourselves, and then you go back out there and you figure it out. But not all of you are created equal. Not all of you are as experienced as the team on your left and right. So we're going to tell you, here are the decisions I'm going to give you, and here are the decisions that I need you to pick up the phone to ask about. And when you couple that mentality, that sort of very structured approach to what decisions lie at what level, with a daily very transparent communication model, you could start to see the different sort of leaders across the spectrum. 7,000 people a day would show up for one meeting, not to listen to our leaders necessarily, but to listen to one another, to learn from each other. Because a new actor would look across and say, okay, there's there's the middle of the road person. I, I want to be able to operate like that team within the next few months. Uh, here's me and my peers. We just got here. We don't get it. We're all over the place. We're still sorting this out. So we have very limited decision-making authorities. 
And here are my rock stars, right? I get to listen to that team every day brief about how much further they're pushing into the threat networks than we're capable of. And they're the ones sitting right at the edge, driving the whole organization to think differently about cascading authorities and, and moving more aggressively. This was a daily classroom amongst peers that were highly motivated to learn, teach, and win. And that changed the mentality, broke down those tribal barriers, and evolved the trust inside the organization. What that eventually got us to was a shift from the mentality that, you know, one problem, one team, to we've got 20 problems going on at any given time. We can deploy those teams simultaneously, but now we have them as networked as the problems on the ground. They are sharing information across boundaries in real time with the headquarters having to get involved at all. And over top of that, the organization has evolved to combine these two systems. That's the, the magic in today's environment. I think that's what's required as we go through this next transition, all of us collectively. <clears throat> so finally, that begs the question of what does it do to our leadership? This is a different sort of model. It's very transparent, it's very quick. You're driving a cultural shift down into the organization. What we were breaking in the military was known as the heroic chess master model. That's the idea that the battlefield's sort of like a, a chessboard, equally arrayed threats on either side. So one smart enough person can make all the centralized decisions. They are the chess master. Generations of senior military leader education was based on this model. I want to create the heroic leader that knows all. Right? It's always been a bit of a fallacy. It worked extremely well in sort of traditional battlefield scenarios for a long time. And there's a reason that senior leaders were coveted as the right general to be in charge of this army. There's a reason that the, the North gave a collective sigh when General Lee went to the South. Right? Because they knew, wow, inside that one person's mind and leadership could be the fate of the nation. There's a reason that Alexander the Great was able to conquer the entire known world before he was 30. He was just really good at logistics and training and leadership. But that has shifted. But the mindset is still deeply ingrained in us. So I love I loved throwing this picture up as a, as a reminder of that fact. I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. You've seen this since you were a small child. Right? A copy of this, the original was actually destroyed in Europe many years ago, but a copy of this sits outside of the Oval Office in the White House. And it has for several presidencies. Right? It's not specific to party. It's meant to tell dignitaries coming from other nations for a visit that this is what we consider leadership. It's a reminder as they walk in to sit down with the president, remember our roots and our heritage. And so when I look at this picture, probably like many folks in this room, Certain things come to mind. You feel a deep sense of commitment, of leadership, stoicism. You're looking at a powerful leader who's ready to free a nation. The funny fact is, almost everything in this painting is wrong. As much as this tells us what it means to be a leader, this is just an artist's depiction of what should have happened that day. But the crossing was not in daylight hours. If it were, the sun is actually facing the wrong way. There are never icebergs like that in the Delaware. They weren't on rowboats. I mean, go down the list. Everything in this is wrong. But it still speaks to us as leaders of what we need to become. Yet it's never quite been true. This is a more modern depiction of the crossing. They were on flat boats because they had to move heavy equipment and horses across. It was at night. It was snowing. The look on the faces of the soldiers crossing is much more serious. They're about to get into conflict. Many of them will lose their lives in the next several hours. And Washington, he's not kneeling on the edge of a rowboat, which is idiotic. He's leaning against the wheel of a cannon to keep his balance, right? Here we see the depiction of a, of a true leader in a moment of severe stress and intensity. But we don't look at this iconic picture and think, oh, that's ridiculous. Who would kneel up on a, on a rowboat? You're just going to fall in and freeze to death before the fight. But it's a challenge as leaders to overcome that hurdle. And that's what our, our leadership said to us. We have to change our, our thinking. 
you can't just tell everybody what to do anymore. And so they started using the language that we were going to lead like gardeners, which does not make a lot of sense to SEAL and Ranger operators. But when they stepped back and, and, and really explained it, they said, look, we are cultivating an ecosystem. We are becoming a winning culture. Gardeners don't go out and yell at tomato plants, right? It just doesn't work. What they do is they identify the environment, they understand the conditions, they build it, they protect it, but most importantly, they know when to step out and stop weeding. If every time you see a problem in one of your units and you go in and you pull a weed, you'll solve that immediate issue, but you're gonna mess up the state of that ecosystem. So I challenge you to know where to draw that line. And for us on the ground, the challenge was, you can't just come to us with every problem. Because if you pull us into that system, we'll pluck a weed, but we're probably gonna create more problems than we're solving for. So this is a two-way relationship between those that are closest to the problems and the, those that are trying to run the organization. And so I'll leave you this thought. If units like this can get their head around that idea, which are as strong-willed and intense as all the teams that folks in this room grew up on, then anyone can get traction on this. Ultimately, the decision is up to leaders to frame that conversation out and start driving the change that can help us all collectively get ahead of this transition that the information is, age has, has brought upon us. So I appreciate the time. I would love to take any questions, but I will look to you. I know we're right at the edge of time. I'm hearing out of time. We're tight on time. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>